that you're here and and this morning that's that song is so powerful because it tells us our there's nothing impossible with god nothing whatever the lord is doing he he can handle anything that you got and i was talking to some folks this week and and one of the guys said to me he said well what if i ask god why i said you would be in the new pastor club and, and what happens, we often, and it's okay to ask the one. Let me tell you about my God. He's bigger than that. He's stronger than that. He's better than that. And, and he knows what you're struggling through and what you're going through today. And he wants to help you. And so today, I, I, I've been praying through this sermon. And I've kicked it around. I got here even extra early this morning because I just was just troubling about it. You, know, you ever have those troubling moments? And the Lord said, why are you worried about this? I said, I don't know. You know, have you ever, did you ever get caught growing up and your daddy asked you why you did what you did? And what was your answer? I don't know. Now, in my case, I blame my twin brother. I said, he made me do it. You know. So I want to take you, in, in, in this sermon, I, I've been preaching a series that became, that really this series was not supposed to be a series. But the Lord just kind of started working in this thing about wind. Now, I, I just want to talk to you about what happens when the wind in your life changes direction. If you were part of our church and you were coming out in the, the, very, the little portico out there, you would understand in the wintertime the wind blows this way. In the summertime it does what? It blows this way. So this constantly messes up my hair. And so what happens, you never know what it's going to do like. Um, and we begin to realize that when, when winds change direction, what are you going to do? I, I put a little picture that our, our folks have done for it. This happened, it's called the dust storm. It happened May 11th, 1934. And some of you, were, you might have been around in that day. I don't know. I and mean, what happened, this windstorm, this dust bowl, if you will, went all the way out in the Midwest, all the way to New York, Boston, and Atlanta. It, it, it was because of the fact that people had took the land out there and started plowing it up, and it, the grass couldn't hold the soil, so they started planting, and, and next thing you know, the wind started blowing. 350 million tons of silt was blown away just through that process. It caused a drought in the region, it was, it was the biggest. We began to see these dust storms, and they just, they just kept getting bigger. They doubled in one year. This went on for a whole year, and it was in the Depression. You've seen movies with Henry Fonda that was in the, talking about people going and trying to find a new life, and people were looking, and they were struggling. People from all around were trying to figure out. And then on April the 15th, 1935, we had what's called the Black Sunday, and the wind once again changed direction, and the wind started blowing. It even caused such a disturbance that our President Franklin Roosevelt had to in, put in place laws about how you can take care of property and what you can and can't do, and the wind blows. This morning, you could share with me about yesterday as the wind was blowing, except when the children were here from one to three. There was no wind. There was a lot of hot air out there, but there wasn't no wind. So I want to take you and talk to you spiritually. What are you going to do when the winds of your life change directions? If you look at Scripture, you'll discover that one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit in Scriptures in the book of Genesis and the book of Acts is wind. The word, the, the word spirit in the, in the Hebrew really beneath all of this tells us it is the breath and the wind of God. On the day of Pentecost, as we read, we see the wind with a mighty force of rushing wind come blowing in. The sounds of power and the force and, and the presence of the Holy Spirit came on them. The wind is one of the most powerful faces of earth. 
I can remember it was pretty close the first year or so I was here. And I was standing in the foyer. I, I love to watch storms. I know I'm a little weird and crazy, but I love to watch storms. When they come up, I don't run and shut all the stuff down. When I was growing up, we had a lightning storm right here. Grandma would tell us to go sit down, get our feet on the couch, and, and, and that because you never knew what was going to happen. So I was out here in the foyer, and the storm was coming. I had the TV on. It was telling me that. And I was kind of looking, and all of a sudden there was kind of a little mini, I call it a little small tornado. I don't know that F1, maybe it was an F minus one or something. I don't know. And, and it came up. He used to have a big sign up, and it took it and twisted it. There was a guy that went down the road. He was with CPI, and he was going down to sell uh, a, a security system. And next thing I know, he comes flying back in here. He, didn't even, he just pulls in, runs into the building like I'm going to save him. Every man for himself is what I told him. But, but it was amazing. You stand here and watch the wind, and it was destroying things. We've seen tornadoes. Some of you who lived here in 1978 when we had the tornado that hit out here where the big Springs Mansion is, and it jumped all around. Some of you have experienced other tornadoes around here. And what happens in our lives is that tornadoes do come in your life. Maybe you don't have one today, and that's praise the Lord for that. But what happens the force of the wind is so powerful that it just tears and rips things. Wind is, is a transforming force. It changes things. If you went to Bennettville, South Carolina, oh, 20 years ago, a tornado sat down and tore one section of the community up. That transformation caused lots of problems. Wind is it's powerful, and it generates things inside of us that we don't understand. And so what we begin to do is we learn that winds are penetrating and they're destructive in everything they do. There are times when we need the Holy Spirit to move on our lives like a warm, gentle summer breeze. And there are other times that the wind of God is to blow the destructive things in our life and it moves them out of our way. The change this morning is inevitable. Many people don't like, so let's do a survey. If you're here for the first time, I love surveys. I'm, I'm, I'm vying for a job on television about surveys. And, and so what happened, how many of you in here um, in your life have seen changes over the last two years? Would you raise your hand? Yeah. Maybe you hadn't experienced it yet because you ain't buying gas. You, went, you go to the gas pump. <laughs> I mean, I thank God I'm not drinking sundrops right now. I mean, them things have gone out outrageous. But the problem of it is, is that changes are inevitable. And, you know, we could go around and be like the ostrich and put our head in the sand, but that won't help you. Because, see, you may not want change. You may have fought against it. You may have prayed against it. Maybe you're at a point where you don't want to accept it, but you're going to have to accept it. I'd say to you that you're going to have to accept change. I don't like where our world's at. I don't like where our country's at spiritually. I, I don't like the things that are happening. I don't like all the undermining. I don't like all the fighting that's going on because we're moving, we're losing the focus of the American people. And we need to pull together and we need to be people that understand that changes. I mean, let, let, let me do a survey. How many of you in this room, uh, when you're, you're my age or younger, how many of you remember when the bell bottoms came out? Yeah, you remember them? Yeah, somebody just showed me they had a pair of them on right now. Those things are back in style. I hope that style goes away quickly. But we all have changes in our life. So I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2. I want to show you a verse, and, and what I want to do is help you understand that you're going to have changes in your life whether you like them or not. Because that's part of a broken world and broken people that we live in. But the Lord tells us something. He gives us in direction through Paul's writings. He tells us that. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Let's take and stop right there. How many of you have done opposite of that? Raise your hand. Okay, you don't understand the question. This is going to be a long sermon. <laughs> so what happens here is that he says, don't copy the behavior, customs of the world. Okay. So we know as Christians that we shouldn't do certain things, but we do them anyway, right? How many of you have ever done that? Okay. 
So, so much simpler that way. But he says, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. I mean, then you will learn to know God and, 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 and what God's will is for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So what we begin to realize is that God says when the winds change, and they will, but what he's telling us is we don't have to adapt and transform. The only change that you need in your life is to do what the Bible says. The Bible is the word of God. It has no errors. It is his breath. It is there to help us and reproof. And so when we make mistakes, and we do, the Lord is showing us what we need to do. I don't know about you, but I've learned that he likes to transform people. And one of the things we learn when we're not a Christian, we call it salvation. It's the first step we make going across the lines and giving our lives to Christ. The other one is we use the little churchy word called sanctification. It means that we ought to be growing in Christ every single day. And we call that a conversion. Our minds are being changed from when we once were. And I believe that we get a fresh start this way. And this morning, you and I can be looking through all the things that are happening in our lives. But if things are going to happen in life and there are going to be changes, and you're going to have to choose to be a part of it or not a part of it. Now, I know there's a lot of us who would would love to be off the grid so that no one could find us. The only thing I can tell you is, is that that's not the way the world is. It needs to be better than what it is. But you can't run no more. You can't hide. These people that who uh, try to outrun the police officers. It does not work. You know why? Because they got radios. And, and they got cameras everywhere. So people try to do stuff like it doesn't work. And, and what happens, uh, it, it doesn't work. I, I was, this has been years ago. My friend Jimmy Strait, who's my good friend, he was working for the Highway Patrol over all them motorcycles and BMWs. You know, you're supposed to be able to stand on them and ride them like that. And, and I don't know if I ever seen Jimmy do that or not, but what happens is uh, people just fly, and they see a little motorcycle pulling up. They don't think that's a police officer until he puts that little siren on and it starts going off. Some of y'all have experienced that, haven't you? And, and what happens? Change happens. You got to make choices, and in life, when change happens, you have to make choices. So I want to show you something. What the Word of the Lord gave me, and and I want to I want to show you this. Change the way we need to look at life. We need to change how we see the wind blowing. Say, so what? Okay, let me show you. When right now our world is in, a, is in a very deep, dark place. Our friends in Ukraine, as we pray for them every single day, and now other countries are being threatened, and we're praying for them that, that the power of the Holy Spirit will change hearts and minds. So why would somebody come and bomb and blow up other places? Why would someone kill innocent people in Buffalo, New York yesterday, shooting people and killing them? Why do people do that? It's because we live in a broken world. Genesis 3, verse 15, go look at it, and you'll discover when that happened, when sin enters the world, things go crazy. But you and I have the power of the Holy Spirit, and the first thing that we need to understand is is that my fault, Thoughts in my mind, my thoughts direct my life. What you think about is what you do. You you see, Proverbs 4.23 says that be careful how you think. Let your your life be shaped by your thoughts. So how many, well, I was going to ask you to raise your hand, but this is probably not a good time. So what happens, some of you are sitting here and you're not hearing what I'm saying. Or you may be saying, well, if he just speed up, we could get on with this. And, and what happens is that the thoughts that you have control what you do. They shape you. Every action in your life, every reaction in your life, everything started in your mind. It didn't start over here some thought that, that someone told you. It starts in your mind. But it can be good thoughts that lead to good behavior for good actions, and then there's bad thoughts that can lead to unhealthy behavior. There are unhealthy habits. There are unhealthy actions. There are unhealthy reactions. And, and often we sabotage ourselves because we're not listening to what the Lord says, and we are people that won't let that happen. See, I love the Bible. God's Word tells us, as a man thinks, so is he. 
If today, maybe you're in a bad relationship and the Lord is trying to move you to change your life and to get maybe work through that relationship if possible. All the habits that you have started in your brain. And what the Lord is telling us, we need to think about how the winds are blowing. How do you see things? Like, how do you look at money? What do you think about money? What do you think about food and sex and about the future and about people coming together? How we see when the wind blows, we need to see it through the eyes of the Lord. When I look back, I, I keep thinking what the Lord is saying to us. He is telling us that I'm allowing these things to happen for you to grow closer to me. Second thing I've learned is that you and I, my struggles start in my mind. My struggles, the struggles that we have. Uh, our young people are getting ready to finish school, and the exams are coming. And, and, and what happens, if you get in your mind that this is going to be hard, you, you're setting yourself up for failure. And the Lord is telling us not to be that way. And he says this in Romans 7, verses 22 and 23. Let me just read. This is one of my favorite tr uh, passages in all of Scripture. I love to do God's will so far as my new nature is concerned. But there's something deep within inside me that is at war with my mind and wins the fight, makes me a slave to the sin within me. In my mind, I want to be God's servant, but instead I find myself still enslaved in sin. Every second that you are awake, your brain is working. Your mind is getting thoughts and processes. And the biggest thing that we battle with today is doing what is right. I had the pleasure of speaking to our young people Wednesday night in their class, and it was about how do you make good decisions. And at the end, the last words I said was these words, is that always do what is right. And then I said, I wish your pastor could tell you he always does it right. I don't. I wish I was. I wish I could. But sometimes things happen, and we don't. But I'm working at it, trying to get better. See, you and I need to understand what we think about, the struggles that we get in our mind. How many of you can wake up in a good mood and then all of a sudden you see something and it puts you in a bad mood? Like right now, yeah. yeah. So what happens is that the Lord is speaking to us and saying that it is so fast. I've seen people, I mean, I, well, my dad's passed away now, so I can talk about it. So I can remember us going to church and, and going away and he is just, he, my twin brother got me in trouble all the time. Yeah. And so what happens, he, we, and my daddy would be on us. I mean, he, would, he was getting ready to pull off Otis. Now, I know some of you don't know what Otis is. Otis is the belt. You do not want him to pull that off. And so what happens, we could be pulling up in the church parking lot, and there would be people standing there, and they would wave, and, and, and they would, somebody would say, roll your window down. My daddy could go from be, getting ready to kill me and Larry to, good morning, God bless you for being here. <laughs> and then you could hear him under his breath saying, boy, you wait till we get home. Uh-huh. That's the day I was trying to go home with somebody. I didn't care who it was. I just want to go home with somebody. So, so in our lives, we, we have these struggles. See, I've learned that stress is a mental struggle. We get under stress. Here at our church, we, we fought through the two years of the COVID. And it was very stressful. Depression is a mental struggle. And, and it's, it, is, it becomes this negative emotion. And for you and I, anger is a mental battle. We get angry and we're driving down the road and people are not moving fast enough. Or things are not doing things and we get angry. Jealousy and resentment and loneliness is a mental battle. Jealousy, uh, when I was growing up, we, you know, some of y'all have experienced this, I'm sure. You, you like some boy or some girl at school and, and they, you know, they sent, you the, sent you the love letters. I love you. Do you love me? Mark X. Y'all did that, didn't you? And then all of a sudden, he or she begins to speak to someone else, and you get jealous. My mama called it the green-eyed monster. And, and, and what happens is that we begin to realize it gets into our mind that something's going on that's really not. Addiction and discouragement and low self-worth, these are all that are internal conflicts in your mind. You say, what am I doing? Listen, we're not the only people that have struggled with this. 
The disciples struggle with this. The followers of Jesus have been struggling with this throughout the years. When Christians were being persecuted like never before, and, and often the doubts and the struggles come. James writes it this way in James 4.1, uh, what causes fights and quarrels among you? In other words, what's causing the conflict? It's because we want it our way. We want things our way. We don't want to compromise. We don't want to talk with people. We don't want to be polite and let people go first. We want to make sure. And this, there's a constant conflict and the battle's inside you. There right now this morning, there's a battle going on in your mind for what you desire. And he begins to tell us, even while we're sleeping, it happens. Now, how many of you in here, let's just have some fun with this survey. How many of you in here uh, have dreams sometimes? Okay. All right. That's good. That's good. You know, as long as you don't talk in your dreams, you're good. And um, so what happens a lot of times, you have a dream, you, you wake up and you try to go back and catch up with it. You ever done that? Yes, you have. I know. Some of y'all are dreaming right now. And, and what happens... <laughs> And so what the Lord is doing, he's trying to help us to understand that, that it's going to be this way all of your life. But we have to do what is right. Paul writes, and he's probably one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. He, he writes, he wrote, wrote Romans 7, 22 and 23, because even Paul, he tells us his testimony. He gives us an honest thing about his life. And Paul is saying, I want to do right but I always do what's wrong. He says the battle is real and we need to understand that. So if Paul struggled with it, I feel better about things, don't you? I mean, he's the super Christian. And so if he struggled, it's okay that I struggle. And, and sometimes what happens, your mind, the reason all this is happening, now hear me out and I'll get to the good spiritual parts here in a minute, but the reason this is happening is because your mind is your greatest asset. Your mind, it, 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 it can do so many wonderful things. And it, when the Holy Spirit is in field in you, it controls and helps you with things. See, if you're a Christian this morning, Satan can't control your mind. He can make lots of suggestions, but he can't. The only thing he can influence in your Christian life is to change your thoughts. Maybe someone does Something to you, you get mad, you don't want to speak to them. That's a sin, by the way. Maybe there's someone in here, I'm not praying for them because they're not living right. Sin on your part. You should be praying for everybody, no matter who they are, where they are, and what level in life they are. We need to encourage each other with that. And, and then we begin to look at it. He says that you and I, these thoughts that are coming through our minds, we need to make sure they're pure. It is where God works in me is my mind. In Ephesians, it says these words in Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. Let the Spirit change the way you think. Make you into a new person. In Romans 8, 6 says, if you think, if your thinking is controlled by your old sinful self, it leads to death. But if it's your thinking is controlled by the Holy Spirit, you, you lead your life to peace. God is working inside of us in our minds and our hearts. And the devil's doing everything he can to keep you off balance and not to focus on him. God works in your mind. You say, how do I know? Just this morning, I, I read the article. I knew exactly what the day was today. It's the National Day for Vacation Bible School. And it was to be prayed for. And I never made a note, never talked to anybody about it. And all of a sudden, I'm getting ready to walk out for the service to start. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, um, this would be a good day to pray for those children. And I thought, okay, you're right. I, I, I will in my prayer. No, no. Today is Vacation Bible School's National Day. So we pray all over America. And we come together like we did the National Day of Prayer. And we pull together and pray for children. Don't you want your children to know Jesus Christ? Absolutely you do. I want my grandchild daughter to make sure she's saved. We baptized her. I held her down until she bubbled in the last summer. And, and we want our children to know Christ. And, and so this is where we, if we want to change the world, we do it with our children, showing them who Jesus Christ really is. Let the Spirit change the way you think. See, for you and this, this is how Satan works. He gets us when, in our weakest moment. Some of you have experienced, my friend Peter in the Bible, at the weakest moment, he denies Christ. 
the other disciples in that weak moment run from all the things that are happening. And we begin to see people in Scripture that say they, they left the church and they don't go to church. See, we need to be praying for folks that God's Holy Spirit will help them to go through this. So I want to teach you something real quick that can apply this for you, is this. Every day I must choose. There, there are several things here. If you want to have the right thinking and you want to try to do the best you can. So let me just do this before I do. How many of you in here, uh, how many of you in here are people that don't sin? How many would you just, you don't sin? Okay. There's a couple of you that think you don't. But not. So what happened, we all sin. We all make mistakes. And at any moment, I want you to listen to me as a Christian. Everybody is one moment away from doing something stupid. You say, well, how do I know? Go to Walmart with me and I'll show you. Right, right now, there's a panic going on in our country. Baby formula. I don't know the answer to it. All I know is I'm praying that God will solve this problem for our country and for those new mamas. I, I just know that when you go in there, people are upset because they're trying to find stuff. And it's not there. Just remember that it's not Walmart's fault. There's other things that's their fault, but not that. We need to be people that are witnesses for the Lord wherever we are. Let me give you this. Every day I must choose to feed my mind with the best thoughts. Philippians 4.8 says it this way. Brothers and sisters, fill your minds with thoughts that are true, noble, right, pure, beautiful, admirable. Think of these things are excellent and worth appraising. So I want to ask you some questions real quick. Am I wise or foolish when I allow things in my mind? Are you foolish today? You're letting things cost you mind that shouldn't be there. Pro Proverbs 15, 14 says, A wise person is hungry for the truth, while the fool feeds with trash. A am I feeding my soul every day with God's word? Matthew 4, 4 says these words, People need more than the bread of life. They must feed on every word of God. Every word of God. And let, me call, let me tell you what this is. When you do that, it's called soul food. It's food for your soul to grow you and to nurture you. And he says, as you, you can't have just bread alone. He says we got to have the word of God because it feeds our soul. No wonder so many people are starving and they're malnutritious in the spiritual realm just because they don't spend time with the Lord. I have five devotions. And I separate them all throughout the day because I, I, sometimes it's just the right devotion. Let me, let me give you, just to prove something to you. I was reading my devotion the other day, and it was this, and it was by Billy Graham. And it says, it is only the concentration or concentrated of the Holy Spirit that the Christian can have victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. It is the Holy Spirit that is doing the fighting for you in the spiritual warfare. We are in a spiritual warfare whether we want to admit it or not, but we are. It's good versus evil. And so you say, well, I got, I'm so messed up, I can't be used. Here, listen to me. Our God, nothing is impossible with our God. And another devotion, it says, God has chosen to use weak ones like you to accomplish his purpose. Your weakness is designed to open up my power. So when you're failing in this thing, God wants to teach you and use you. He wants to give you the power to do these things. And he wants us to stay away from it. So, so would Jesus say that you're a disciple for him? That's a question that needs to be asked. A disciple follows Jesus, reads his word, prays, works with the children, helps people. And, and, and I don't care how well we plan here in our church, there's always going to be a problem. Yesterday, where the kids were out back, and our Norm and his team made sure everything was cut, clean. The preacher got rid of the geese for him. He got rid of them again this morning, too. I didn't hurt them. I just chased them with my black truck. And what happens, <laughs> this week I come in, and we, we have a little nickname for these two geese that started Adam and Eve. And they're multiplying. <laughs> so what happens, I, I come in this morning making my, coming around, I have, I'm usually hustling, getting through here, and, um, and I get out here and they see the black truck. 
and they're looking, he's going to run over us. And they take off. I'm chasing, and they're flying away. I hope nobody, I hope I don't get in trouble for that. But, but for you that love them so much, all we want you to do is come on Saturday night about 7 o'clock, and you can pressure wash the sidewalks all that off. This is where the church says what? Amen. Does, we need to think about this, and, and I'm trying to have fun this morning because some of you are lucky been winged on a dill pickle, and I, I want you to lighten up a little bit. Does my media intake, my TV and radio and reading, does it create freedom or frustration? I've really worked in the last 30 days to cut my TV off the news. I listen to the local weather for the, about the first five minutes because the next 55 minutes is just repeat, repeat, repeat. And I've learned that I'm, I'm not as frustrated because I get frustrated with things. And, and, and what happens, he says, are we paying more attention to the media and all that or are we paying attention to his word? See, to me, this is how I feel about all this. Garbage in, garbage out. Truth in, truth out. John 8 says it this way, if you continue my word, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know truth, and the truth will set you free. And what I love about that is a lot of non-Christians use that verse in talking about this. But let me say this. If you read the verse before that, this is what it says in John 8, 30. Then many who hear him say these things in him. It's like they believe I can be a Christian, and I can, I can just trust the Lord in everything. Until you become a Christian and sell out to Jesus Christ, you don't know what it is to trust him. You don't know what it is to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit in your mind and your heart. See, it's not some kind of mathematical formula. It's not some musical truth. It's not physical truth. It's the truth of God. God said it, and that's what you need to believe and be a part of that. Psalms 119, David writes, how I love your teachings. I think about them all day long. This is why we teach in our church to start your day off with a devotion, a de simple devotion. Don't get all them complex ones. Get you a simple one and just read it and let that think through your mind and, and let it be a positive thing. So as, I have five because I probably sin more than y'all do. And so I have to have all these different things to remind me what's going on. And what we've learned to do is that these devotions and Bible reading that we do, we ponder those things and we think about what God is doing. And then you get to hear stories of people, how the Lord has healed people and how people are changing. The second thing I must do every day is I need to free my mind from destructive thoughts. I hear it all the time. People say, I just hate him or I hate her. What? What did you say about me when I'm not there? It, it, it's, you can't be a Christian and have that kind of attitude and use those words. We hate nobody. We love all people because God created them. And it is our job to remove this destructive force in our minds. You're either controlled by the devil, thoughts that he puts in your mind and that you allow them, or you're controlled by God's thought that the Spirit can put in your mind and help you through. Here's the point. Your mind needs to be liberated. It needs to be delivered. It needs to be released. It needs to be set free. Why? Because if you have dominant thoughts that are wrong all the time, God can't use you. You ever been around a person who's real negative? Don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at your neighbor. I mean, they're negative about everything. Or, or you'll be around a person who always is one-upping you. You tell the story. And they one up. Where I come from, we one up again. One of us is going to venture to tell a lie. So what happens, we, we get around people like that, and they drive, they drive you crazy. I mean, what you have to do is learn what I've learned to do. They'll just be talking, and I just walk away. <laughs> yeah. And, they, and then all of a sudden, they realize, I'm gone. Well, here's the point. See, my old nature gets me in trouble. It gets me in trouble. And, and I have my hearts. My, I get hurt just like you do. I have habits I'm trying to get rid of. I, I, I can get involved in things that are wrong. And, and, and the Lord teaches me that he loves me and his thoughts come to my mind. The old nature is always, let me tell you something. I don't care who you are in this room. I don't care where you are on live stream. You're always going to battle this. You can talk to my friends, Tom Matthews. 
and he will tell you he's a recovered alcoholic, teaches people how to stay away from it, and he can tell you it's only, he can, we're all one step away from sinning. And he tells us that, that we need to get rid of these destructive thoughts. The second thing is, is working against us is Satan himself. Satan hates you. You're, don't buy into what the world says that you can do whatever you want to and be where you want to and go and do what you want to and it'll be, all be all right. That's not true. Satan hates you and he wants to destroy you. He wants you to be bad in front of people. He wants you to be the talk of the town. And he says these words in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight are not the weapons of the world. Our weapon has a divine power to demolish strongholds. We, we demolish any argument, every pretensions to seek itself against the knowledge of God, take captivity of every thought, and make it obedient to Christ. Satan doesn't care that you come to church on Sunday morning. But he gets mad when you take what you've learned and go do something with it. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and the Lord, he, the Lord's speaking to you, but the devil's on the other shoulder and he's trying to get you to be confused. You have to stop and say, look, you need to take a hike. You need to go on. Leave me alone in the name of Jesus. And I promise you, if you begin to do that, these destructive thoughts will go away. Satan, let me just say this. Any area in your mind that you're holding on to bitterness, any area that you're holding on to resentment, jealousy, envy, you have already yielded to the part of your brain to the devil. These are not of God. These things are of the devil himself, and he works that way. You need to hear what I'm saying this morning. He hates you today he will hate you tomorrow but your God loves you you know how I know he loves you because he sent his son Jesus down the cross that you and I can be set free John 1 says it this way in chapter 2 verse 16 and, and all is the world is this this is what you need to memorize this piece all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life it is not of the Father. It is of the world. So where, do we, where does it lead us? Nothing encourages me more than to learn and to realize I'm wrong in an area. And we need to understand these strongholds could be mental issues. It could be things of jealousy. It could be things that we think it ought to go this way. Spiritual warfare is a mental warfare. And you need to understand our country is fine. Woke up dealing with mental issues. And our Christ has already won the battle for us. We just need to do that. So I, some of you are sitting asking me, what is a stronghold? A stronghold is a lie you believe. That's what a stronghold is. is you believe a lie and it holds on. It can be false value. It can be a world value system. It can be materialism. It can be a personal attitude. It can be an issue of worrying. It can be a stronghold of envy. And all of these things, because they're mental battles. So I just want to quickly teach, teach you something else. How temptation works. Temptation is not always some big thing, but here's how it works. James 1, temptation comes from the lure of our own evil desires. This evil desire leads to evil actions, and then the evil actions lead to death. Let me, let me tell you how it works. This is, this is how it works. First of all, the first thing you get is the desire. It's like I'm riding around, and I love vehicles. I love the, I mean, Jonder bought her a new car. I just love to walk in, and I open the door, and just breathe in all that fresh new odor. And so all week long, I've been looking around, trying to find me a, another car or a truck thank god they ain't none on the lots and so what happens is that we we get a desire and, and then the second thing is doubt did god really say that if you were read genesis three fifteen, that satan says lucifer says did, did god really say that 
And if Satan, if you start having these questions, did God really say that? It's Satan trying to get you to, to be off course, to cause doubt. And then third is deception. See, believing a lie of Satan is deception. What happened? He knows your weaknesses. You say, how does he know? He's not the all-knowing God. So let's just do a survey. How many of you in here sit in the same place every Sunday? Okay. Okay. Next week, you'll be like, uh, they'll, they're, you know, uh, Charles and Lila, they moved on me this week. Trying to, so when you move, I don't pray for you because I can't remember where you are. <laughs> so, so what happens, we need to be people that are trying because, see, Satan learns your patterns. If you're driving on the interstate and you're a speeder, you know it's wrong. And what happens, he knows your patterns. He knows when you go to Charlotte, like yesterday, maybe some of you went to Charlotte, and, and you were up there and they had this, the soccer uh, game or something. I, I imagine the place was packed out. All that was it? So some of y'all were right in the middle of that suffering yesterday. And, and what happened? That Satan knows your actions. He knows your behavior. He knows what you think because why? Because he watches what you read. He watches what you, what you watch on television. He, he knows who you're talking to. And he knows what they're saying. And I'm just trying to get you the truth. But deception is to deceive people. It is to, it's to get the hook into you so he can pull you away. See what happens. This temptation has come and, and you start looking at it. And all of a sudden you start realizing, man, this looks pretty good. This is what happened to Adam and Eve. Eve was not by herself, folks. Adam was standing right there with her. And she sees it, and it, it comes to her eyes, and it looked good. I don't know what the fruit was. Some of you say it's an apple. I don't know. But I'll tell you this. It, it, if it catches your eye, do you know why car commercials are done the way they do? Now, I know a little bit about automobile stuff. When I was growing up, what they did, if you wanted to sell a car, you had to get it on a winding road with wet pavement, and you had to have a cigarette with FM radio on going on. And that's how it was. You want one of them cars. And, and today, what they do is the same thing they did back in those days. They make them look fast and sleek. They don't, you know, and they do all these things. And it's to get your eye. This is why Satan can do it so easily to us every single day. And you know what happens when we get caught up in that? We become disobedient and we become defeated. And that is the goal of how Satan works. He wants to make sure you're defeated every day. You have someone that you fall out with in the church and you start thinking about it all the time and you don't pray about it. God says in his word, he says, how many times am I to forgive somebody? So if somebody does something to me, I'm to do what? To forgive how many times? Every time. Every time. Every time. And it's not easy doing that. Because what happens, he says, I got to choose these things I must do. I got to choose them every day. The, the last one is, uh, to, to let Jesus, my mind, on what matters the most. What is the most important things that you're thinking about? Is it about, me and, me and Larry was laughing because we were, we're big Atlanta Brave fans. We ain't doing too good right now. We're six games back. Might as well be 60 right now for us. And what happened, we get our mind on those things. And, and when something's not right, we start trying to think what we would do. I've never played Major League Baseball. I've coached a few teams from the television set. But what happens, <laughs> we don't know what, we've never experienced that. But sometimes in your Christian life, when people are struggling, you've never experienced what they're experiencing. And what do we do? We get beside them and start praying. This is what the word of the Lord says do. So let me give you a couple of quick suggestions. Number one, try this. Think about Jesus throughout the day. Keep your mind on Jesus, as Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2, 28, or 2, 8. The other thing is think about others. Quit thinking about yourself. Think about other people. Philippians 2, 4 says, don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others. Be concerned. Pick up the phone and call them. And our church, I love it because people do it. And then the last thing, I want you to think about eternity. Where are you going to spend your life with Jesus? Are you going to spend a life with Jesus or are you going to be in hell? 
You need to know there's only two places. It's A is heaven, B is hell. Which one will it be? And the Bible tells us how to do this. Colossians 3, 2 says it this way. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think about things down on earth. Our minds need to be on heaven. As the older we get, the more we need to think about heaven. So the Lord is speaking this morning. He's telling us that we need to understand the winds blow. And sometimes the winds are bad and they're strong and they cause tornadoes and they tear everything up. But the Lord has a purpose and plan. Sometimes I think the reason it happens is because we hold on to material possessions too tight. What are you holding on to this morning? Are you holding on to something that someone did to you months ago, but you haven't been to them, you hadn't prayed with them, you hadn't encouraged them, you hadn't talked about it, talked to everybody else except the person you need to be talking to? We need to be people who don't do it that way. I've learned to pray more than ever before, and most of the times the things that I get upset about, I never have to deal with because I give it to the Lord. He deals with it. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I want to I want to pray for you in just in a second. And we're going to open this altar up. Maybe you need to come and kneel. And maybe there's something you're working with in your life. And God is saying, I want you to come and give it to me. Maybe the winds have changed in your life. And you don't like the change. I understand. My heart breaks for you. But the Lord says there's a way to adjust to this and fix this. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, I... You give us our minds, and you have given us the instructions on what to do with our minds. Now you pray in your quietness of your heart. You just say, Lord, I realize that my thoughts direct my life. Lord, I realize that the struggles that I'm going through in me are actually what's happening in my mind. And then, Lord, maybe we would realize that in our minds is where God's Spirit works. Lord, help us to do what you've called us to do. I'm going to ask you to help me every day to choose to feed my mind with best thoughts. Feed, feel free to do whatever you want to do in my life. Help me to stay away from those destructive thoughts. You, oh Lord, that's what I need to think about and about eternity. Jesus, come into my heart and mind. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with my mind, Lord with your love and your grace and mercy. I'm going to wait just for a moment. Maybe the Lord is speaking to you this morning and you want to come down. Maybe you don't know Christ as your Savior. I would love to introduce you to Jesus. Maybe there's something you're holding on to and there's someone in the room you need to go to. Don't be ashamed. Go to it. Work it out. Straighten it out. Make it right. While we wait.